Let me uh, welcome everybody. I'm Bob Wise. I'm the president of the Alliance for Excellent Education. Uh, before that, I had the privilege of being governor of West Virginia and also serving in the United States House of Representatives 18 years. So I think I've seen the, the uh, connections and sometimes disconnections between federal and state policy, and I appreciate Bill Simons uh, inviting me to moderate this incredible, incredible panel. Incidentally, because we are an adaptable panel, uh, it may be necessary for uh, uh, Secretary uh, Dan Messier to slip out early, but don't worry. She has brought with her uh, Sharon Miller, uh, also with the U.S. Department of Education as Director of Division of Academic and Technical Education. So we're well covered. Uh, we have one panelist who is somewhere, we think, in the air. Better to be there than in the cloud. Oh, actually, he's right here, Dane Lynn. Always a dramatic entrance. <laughs> I tell you, Dane, you never made that entrance when you were with National Governors Association, but, but now that you're with BRT, just timing is perfect. And so, Dane, we're very thankful because he's been fighting to get here all day. So let me uh, uh, open up. We're going to have, I'm going to make a few introductory remarks. We're going to see a couple of brief videos from members of Congress who wanted to be here, were not able to be. Uh, and then hear from our panel, and it's a panel in terms of what is federal, getting federal policy right. You couldn't ask for a better panel than this, and particularly two of whom are directly in charge of getting federal policy right as being federal policy makers, and two others who work very closely and have for a number of years, uh, putting, trying to make sure that what they're working on uh, is what, what, what works. So, um, the my organization, the Alliance for Excellent Education, our mission is that every child graduates from high school ready for college and career. And so multiple pathways, different pathways for achieving that. Raising, yes, the, the high school graduation rate, as Governor Fallon talked about, being uh, still way too, the dropout rate or the graduation rate way too low. And at the same time, making sure that that college diploma truly does mean college and career ready. Uh, and, and of course, today an emphasis on what does the career part of it. I uh, first ran for governor in 1966. Now, you say child prodigy. I was 16. I ran, I ran and I lost. And I lost because of this conference, and so here's why. I was 16, it was a summer camp, a mock election, I ran for governor, and the person who beat me had a slogan, this is in 1966, of the only passport from education, the only passport from poverty uh, is, is education. And so he could just as well have worded it, the only passport to prosperity is education. And he was right then, in, uh, 40 years ago in West Virginia, uh, or anywhere in the country, and he's right today. And so that's why this conference really s resonated with me. It's, and I, I'm happy to say I learned that lesson. He, and I was so impressed with what he said that I almost voted for him. The, uh, uh, and did once, once the primary was over. So this is an information age economy. And what in, in an information age economy, education is the only currency. And what's significant about this conference is it doesn't matter whether it's an information age economy no matter what industry you're in. If for where Dane and I come from, West Virginia, uh, you, you're most, where our most traditional industry is coal mining, it is still a far different industry today with a higher, much higher skill level, which incidentally requires post-secondary certification in order to even be able to get into the mines. And by the, so whether you're talking about mining, agriculture, or the most sophisticated IT, this is an, this is an economy that is constantly uh, uh, exponentially increasing in the need for skilled workers and workforce needs. I'm uh, Tony Carnavali, of course, uh, Georgetown, and his, his seminal work on the workforce needs of the future. Uh, Governor Fallon was citing uh, some of his work earlier Three, 40 years ago, three quarters of all jobs were high school diploma or less. Today, 60% of all jobs require some kind of post-secondary, and the number is only growing. I want to talk, I've heard the term uh, bandied or, or talked a lot about, about the Sputnik moment. I was even older than Ron Ferguson when uh, Sputnik was going overhead. So indeed, this is a Sputnik moment, but it's a Sputnik moment and so if I, in, in some different ways. The interesting thing about Sputnik is most of you don't recall, which I do, is that three, within three weeks, two critical events happened in our nation's educational history, and yet they were not connected. 
And so Sputnik was one, which as I recall was uh, October the 4th, 1957. Three weeks prior, uh, two and a half weeks prior to that, there was another major event in education that helped shape our educational development that was never connected to Sputnik, but every bit as major. Any idea what it is? It was close. It was a forced integration of uh, Central High School in Little Rock. First time that federal, uh, the federal government had ever, ever intervened to assert the rights of uh, children of color to attend a school. And so you had the civil rights imperative on one side and you had the national economic and defense imperative on the other and nobody connected them up. So let me connect them up and why, why this is so important today. Because if, and I have to shamelessly refer to one of the reports that's in your book uh, that my organization put out called the inseparable imperatives. Because if you look at the demographics of this country, what you see today is that, first of all, 12 of our states now have a majority of the, the public school children are children of color ethnicity. 10 more states is between 40 and 50 percent. So 22 of our states now have at least 40 percent of our children are children of color or ethnicity. And incidentally, those 22 states encompass two-thirds of the entire student population in our country. So this is, these are students today. They're our workforce and our consumers for tomorrow. And that's, I'd like to add an element that I'm not sure has been brought up here. I've listened to a lot of the presentations. As there has been a lot of discussion about workforce needs, let me talk about economic needs for a second. Because there's another factor that often goes off overlooked. And that is that two-thirds of the United U.S. economy is consumer driven. The GDP depends two-thirds upon consumers buying goods and services. And so now what level are those workers going to be able to consume? Are they going to be $9 an hour? consumers, that's what a high school dropout makes at the peak of his or her earnings career, or will they be 23 to 25 to 30 dollar an hour consumers? So this conference is not just about, in my mind, is not just about producing the, the workforce that is so desperate for this country, it's also producing the consumers that are so desperate for this country. So the economic imperative and the equity imperative are now inextricably linked. Sputnik and Little Rock are no longer three weeks apart and in, in, in many ways eons apart. They are inextricably linked. And so that's what, um, that's what I think the significance of this conference is. So we're, uh, so in by providing high school students with more engaging, and I, there's a lot of discussion on that. I can go back to the, what is it, 2006, 2007, first civic enterprises study. Half of all students, uh, the silent epidemic, half of all students uh, leave high school because they don't feel sufficiently engaged. A lot of research and work done uh, uh, after that, uh, reinforcing that. So with engagement, a major problem. Uh, but by providing students with more engaging, inquiry-led work that is relevant to their daily life and future goals, the nation can see significant improvements in graduation rates and achievements. It's already taking place, and a number of it's, Governor Fallon made some references today, whether you're from California and you've been working with linked learning, whether you're with NAF and National Academies Foundation, I don't mean to leave anybody out there, a number of initiatives that essentially combine the four elements uh, in path, the Pathways to Prosperity project. And so it's about implementation. I've got a country song I'm getting ready to do. There's been a whole lot of adoption going on federal, at the federal level, uh, at the state level, the Common Core, a number of states have adopted significant policies. But now we're moving from adoption to implementation. And so that's, that's the key. And, that, and I hope one of the major uh, action items that comes out of this. I think it's also important in terms of progress, noting in federal policy, noting that President Obama in his State of the Union message re specifically referred to a, a school that was engaging students, uh, uh, P-TECH was in Brooklyn, I believe. That's right. Uh, in Brooklyn, that is specifically engaging students using career and technical education. And so, um, I'm very, uh, I, I've 
make my living and in, in my family and I live now in Washington where we've been for the last eight years. We were there, of course, previously. You hear a lot about hyper-partisanship, but the one encouraging note, I'm, I want to warn you all, first, is that all through this discussion, I'm the one of the last uh, in Washington, they're thinking of putting me in the Smithsonian or uh, endangered species list for being a glass half full person. I believe that in the next two years a lot can be done. Uh, talk to me later. Uh, but, uh, but, but in the glass half full, I, one of the reasons I believe that is because education is the one area that historically has been as much more free of partisanship than all the other issues. Now, there, re there are other reasons that education legislation hasn't moved. Um, we're, s we're now five years into the count for ESEA renewal. But there are reasons that education ha legislation hasn't moved. But I don't blame partisanship as much as I is, is a number of other factors. And so that's why I'm, I'm encouraged. And then also we have an administration that is very active and is determined to push it. And once e the executive branch is pushing, then Congress says, whoops, maybe we ought to get into this game. So I happen to believe that there are a number of uh, uh, opportunities. We also, you also have, of course, uh, the legislation that will be talked about here today, WEA, a Workforce Investment Act, the uh, Perkins, uh, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act renewal, Higher Education Act comes up shortly. And so a number of issues to talk about. Before I introduce our esteemed panel, uh, we do, we're fortunate to have a video message from uh, United States Senator Patty Murray, uh, Senator Murray, of course, from the state of Washington. Uh, she's chairman of the Senate Subcommittee on Employment and Workforce Safety and a strong advocate for career and technical education and workforce investment. She's also chair of the Budget Committee, which uh, she's has, has her employed today. The, we, uh, and likewise, we also have a message from uh, Congressman Glenn Thompson from the 5th District of Pennsylvania. Congressman Thompson has been a a uh, strong advocate as well for career and technical education, serving on the House of Representatives Subcommittee on Higher Education and Workforce Training for the, Depart uh, for the Committee on Education. So I think it's very significant, once again, going to this issue of bipartisanship, having Senator Murray, a Democrat, Senator Thompson, or Congressman Thompson, a Republican, uh, and these introductory videos, and then I'll come back and introduce our panelists, and we'll get started. So let me get out of the way. So while we're, while we're waiting, um, let me go ahead and introduce our panelists, and do I have at least one minute? Yes. Okay. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce our panelists and so that we can move right into that, that part of the program. We're very privileged, as I say, to have both two uh, people who are making the policy today as well as two that are uh, greatly affected. The first is Dr. Brenda uh, Dan Messier, the Assistant Secretary for Vocational and Adult Education at the U.S. Department of Education. Brenda, thank you very, very much for being here. Thanks for keeping it brief. Uh, um, we're doing everything we can. Uh, uh, second, uh, always the master of the uh, great exit and also our entrance. <laughs> <laughs> you're not allowed to exit. <laughs> so I might exit soon. Uh, no, 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 now you're here. We want you to stay. Uh, but uh, Dane Lynn, and Dane is uh, heading up the educational work at Business Roundtable, and before that was uh, at the National Governors Association for a number of years, where you may, where one of the people uh, largely responsible for the Common Core standards and uh, coming, coming to fruition. Uh, we also are very fortunate to have uh, sec Assistant Secretary for Employment and Training Administration in the United States Department of Labor, uh, Jay Notes. Thank you, uh, Secretary, for being here. And finally, uh, uh, Alicia Heislop from the Assistant Director of Public Policy at the Association for Career and Technical Education. Now, Alicia, you, I heard this quote, so I just want to check with you, that you had said you were a little reluctant to come because you had been on maternity leave and this is your first day back. Well, yeah. and, you were, <laughs> and you were a little afraid of what had happened on federal policy. Trust me, honey. <laughs> <laughs> You have missed a thing. <laughs> so you ready? Yeah. And now, take it away. <laughs> Hello, I'm U.S. Senator Patty Murray from Washington State. Thank you for inviting me to be part of your program today. I'd like to start off by recognizing Governor Wise and Assistant Secretary Dan Measure, along with Bill Simons and the entire Pathways to Prosperity project for bringing everyone together today. 
As all of you know, middle class families are struggling. The economy is turning around, but too many Americans are still looking for work. Too often I hear from business owners who want to hire new employees, but can't find workers with the skills and training they need to fill those open positions. There's a real skills gap in our economy that we need to address, and that's what I want to talk about today. We have to ensure that our students get the academic and career skills they need to develop into the next generation of leaders and highly skilled workers that will drive our economy. And to do that, we must develop clear pathways from the classroom to the workforce that connect those high-skilled, educated workers with good-paying jobs in expanding industries. That's why I'm very excited about a bill I've introduced called Promoting Innovations to 21st Century Careers. My bill creates more public-private partnerships to help bridge the gap between high school and post-secondary education and the workplace. And it makes sure high school students have an opportunity to gain real-world work experience linked to rigorous academic learning. Too often I hear from students who feel that what they learn in school isn't relevant to the work they will do when they graduate. And unfortunately, they're often right. But it doesn't have to be this way. My bill can help build those strategic partnerships and make sure we are developing new pathways for people to enter competitive jobs. We also need to make sure all our workers, not just young ones, are able to upgrade their skills to keep their jobs and find new ones. That's why I've been working to reauthorize the Workforce Investment Act, legislation that supports our nation's primary workforce development system, making it more flexible, more coordinated, and more accountable. So thank you for all you do to create these pathways to prosperity for our young people. I'm proud to be your partner in the U.S. Senate and look forward to continuing to work together on these issues. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your conference. Good afternoon. I'm Congressman Glenn G.T. Thompson and I represent Pennsylvania's 5th District and the U.S. House of Representatives. It's a pleasure to speak with you on an issue that is very near and dear to me, career and technical education, which is at the very heart of creating pathways to prosperity. Now, I was first elected to Congress in 2008. Prior to that, I had served for close to three decades in nonprofit community health care as a therapist, uh, rehab services manager, and a nursing home and hospital administrator. Now, I've also worked as uh, on the Workforce Investment Board as a member of that organization a member of a local school board, and a member of my local private industry council. It was there that I realized that an employer's most crucial and critical asset isn't the location, it isn't the business plan, it's actually having a qual highly qualified and trained workforce. And without that, a business cannot succeed. Now, throughout my life, I have realized there is more than one path to success. Not every child is college bound. For those that are not, pathways to career and technical education should be emphasized. And during this time of economic uncertainty and record high unemployment, career and technical education programs provide a lifeline for the underemployed who look to begin new careers and those young adults just starting out in the rapidly evolving job market. For these very reasons, once elected to Congress, I became a member of the Education and Workforce Committee in 2009, which handles legislation affecting education and job training including the Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical Education Act, the Workforce Investment Act, and the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. For the last two terms in the U.S. House, I've also had the distinct privilege of serving as co-chairman of the Bipartisan Career and Technical Education Caucus, alongside with my good friend and colleague from Rhode Island, Congressman Jim Langevin. Now, I understand Jim is scheduled to be with you today, and I'm happy he's there to represent the Career and Technical Education Caucus. It has been our shared goal to educate our colleagues in Congress about the value of career and technical education uh, and for Congress to recognize that the demand for the 21st century skills begins very early. In addition to promoting awareness, Jim Langvin and I, alongside of the dozens of Career and Technical Education Caucus members, continue to push for adequate federal investments in CTE. The Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical Education Act originally authorized in 1984 and most recently in August of 2006 is the primary federal support mechanism for CTE programs. The 2006 Perkins Act raised the expectations for students participating in career and technical education by instituting local accountability requirements. 
States and localities have partnered to employ stronger methodologies to improve the achievement of CTE students in order to fulfill the workforce needs of businesses and employers across the country. Programs are held accountable for student achievement in areas including academic and technical attainment, completion and credential attainment, and placement in further education and careers. In 2011, despite our best efforts, the Perkins allocation was reduced by $140 million. As a result, high schools, career technical education centers, and community and technical colleges have adapted by decreasing professional development and prolonging capital improvements. For these reasons, the CTE Caucus has annually weighed in with the House Appropriations Committee to ensure that Perkins funding is not further reduced. We fully intend to send a loud and clear message to the House Appropriations Committee that career and technical education remains our priority going into the fiscal year 2014. Now, Outside of funding, I continue to push for reforms to these programs that expand local flexibility. Over the next year, we will begin talks with the stakeholders with regard to reauthorizing the Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical Education Act. Now, I'm appreciative of the Obama administration putting forth a blueprint for the President's expectations. Now, I welcome this dialogue and I believe that as we continue to look at other critical pieces of legislation, such as the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and the Workforce Investment Act improvements in these areas can and will be made. And one example is the Education for Tomorrow's Jobs Act which I introduced last year. Currently, school districts must submit education plans to the Department of Education, outlining how they intend to use federal education funding. Now, this bill provides new flexibility for school districts to integrate academic and technical instruction. It encourages the creation of partnerships between school districts, institutions of higher education, local industry, and other community stakeholders. As many of you know, American competitiveness is contingent upon the next generation of young minds attaining both the knowledge and necessary skills to graduate high school and be career and college ready. The pace of change in Washington is often glacial, but we recognize that continued advocacy will expand awareness and support. Now, while I was not able to join you personally today, I appreciate your continued support and hope that you will enjoy the remainder of the symposium. Thanks again for what you do and thanks for allowing me to join you by video today. So it, in those remarks, oh, thank you. Um, in those remarks, I find a couple of interesting uh, points worth noting before I turn it over. First of all, a leading Democrat, Senator Murray, a leading Republican uh, on the House Education Committee, uh, uh, Congressman Thompson, both affirming CTE in, a, in very strong ways, and both also involved in some aspect of the appropriations process. He's actually more involved in authorizing, writing the legislation, but when, a, when the House appropriators find a determined group coming to them, they, have to pay they do have to pay attention to it. So I think that's uh, uh, an interesting thing. I think we ought to recognize what each role is. These representatives, the senator, the representative, will they will write the leg they will finally vote on legislation at some point that could be a to d this year not likely um, I feel like Stephen Colbert can I just put my words out here uh, could be this year uh, or next year or it could be off in the future where they will have a great impact is obviously in the annual appropriation process the people that actually will then be presenting legislation for them to consider and will be running programs on a daily basis are those from the executive branch. And so why don't we start off with our two assistant secretaries. Uh, Dr. Dan Messier, if, if we could start with you and then uh, Secretary Oates and then, and then uh, to the two uh, uh, leading policy people and then open it up. But if, if you would during your remarks uh, uh, or perhaps in the question and answer, address likelihood of action, where the administration is going, and also WEA, Perkins, HEA, ESEA, often to a lot of us seems like a pretty siloed set of operations, and is there a way to bring that uh, more closely together, both at the federal level, in turn driving that message to the state? Thank you very much, Governor. I just really wanted to congratulate Bill and Simons on this conference today. It's just a wonderful turnout, and to have to turn people away really shows that 
we're on the right course, really talking about career pathways, so congratulations, Bill. Um, I'm really proud to be here to share Ed's perspective as the Assistant Secretary. I tell everybody I have the best portfolio in all the Department of Education. I oversee adult education, community colleges, career and technical education, and correctional education. So creating pathways is really important for all of the folks that we serve, whether they're youth in school, uh, opportunity youth, or low-skilled adults. So, And I'm also joined by my colleague, Sharon Miller. And I'm sorry, I do have to cut, catch a plane. Dane and I have to catch a plane. And Sharon's going to come up here if uh, there are still additional questions and answers. You know, there's just unprecedented support for Career Pathways. You heard it this morning. Uh, and I'm talking about uh, throughout the state houses and also at the White House. And I was happy you mentioned, Governor Weiss, that uh, the president talked about P-TECH. But he got even more specific than that. He talked about making sure that all young people have the skills necessary to participate in the economy and to secure high quality, high wage jobs. He also talked about uh, a brand new high school redesign proposal and that that would prepare young people for the, the new technology of the future and how it was necessary to create partnerships with colleges and business and to focus on STEM. Um, I don't have any details on that new high school redesign initiative. Um, stay tuned for the budget when the budget is released and there'll be more details to follow. But um, I don't know how many of you have ever heard the talk, the president uh, in a State of the Union talk so specifically about our work. It's thrilling, really. And um, I also don't know if you know that in the First Lady's box, there were two CTE students. And we think that's the first time that that ever happened. So that's just absolutely unprecedented support. And as the Congressman talked about, uh, our administration's goal has been to really scale up career pathways. And last April, we released our blueprint to transform career and technical education, and you all should have a one-pager on our blueprint that describes the four core principles in our blueprint. We want to make sure that career and technical education programs are aligned to the local and regional labor market needs. We want to foster stronger collaboration among secondary, post-secondary, and business and industry. We want to have stronger accountability systems so that we can um, show the programs. We can have evidence of programs that are doing well. We can identify gaps that need to be closed. And we can really reward programs that exceed targets. And I don't think you would be surprised that in the Obama administration, we're also focused on innovation. Our fourth principle is a focus on innovation. And we're proposing to carve out of the Perkins uh, uh, appropriation an innovation fund so we can really spur innovation at the local state level whether they're state policies or programs but at the core of our proposals um, we really want to focus on high quality CTE programs that are well aligned and that all students are college and career ready you heard the discussion this morning it's not an either-or proposition all students have to be college and career ready we want to make sure we're integrating a line, the academic content, the employability skills, and the technical skills that all students need. We want to make sure the students have access to work-based learning opportunities, and we need to increase the numbers of students who have certificates, licenses, industry-recognized credentials, and post-secondary degrees. But you know, CTE really in and of itself shouldn't be viewed in isolation, but it should be part of the career pathways system, and we believe very strongly about that. And I wanted to just talk very briefly, um, and I know many states are doing this work, uh, and I commend you. There are many of you in the audience who are doing this work. You've articulated a vision for career pathways. You've uh, statewide advisory boards, and you've defined and refined statewide policies. It was interesting. Sharon and I met with some folks from Aurora today who are part of the Par Pathways to Prosperity. They brought their whole team to meet with us to really talk about the partnerships and the state policies that they've been able to put in place to advance this work. It's really very, very impressive and a good model of what needs to happen going forward. But we're also working across the federal government. Jane and I work very, very closely together. And I don't know how many of you know, last April, we released a joint letter, Department of Labor, HHS, 
and the Department of Education really suggesting to states that they focus on career pathways as the framework. We've provided a definition of career pathways and an implementation guide for practitioners. So we take this work very seriously at the federal government, even across our agencies. And as a result of the le letter, and there was a lots of interest in this work, we held the first ever national convening on career pathways. And again, it was our three agencies, along with the National Governors Association, who sponsored this national conversation on career pathways. Bill Simons was also part of it. And it was just a, a wonderful way for, for practitioners, for policymakers, for federal officials to come together to talk about how we can expand career pathways. And I, I, I wanted to also recognize my colleagues colleague Lydia from the Department of Transportation who is in the room, please stand up. Because Jane, I, I'm, um, they've come to us and are very interested in signing on to our Career Pathways letter and have even, um, are even funding some work. They've given us some funds to really focus on Career Pathways, particularly as they work at the Department of, if they're focused on transportation. But we also know there are other federal agencies that want to join this work. So I think maybe we ought to talk about a second generation of our letter that will really um, include even more federal agencies. So that's my introduction, and I'll leave it open to questions and answers, and thank you very much. Bob, I hope you don't mind this, but Dane's on the same flight as Brenda, yep. and since we're all friends and nobody here is on circuit, why don't you talk, and then okay. maybe we could take the questions. Alicia has agreed that we could let them take a few questions, go sure. next, and then Jane, we'll, this is a kind of we'll business department, <laughs> federal government relationship That's that right. everyone's been That's striving right. for. Exactly. That's right. Right. It's a good so let me introduce Dane Lynn, and let me just uh, preface this by saying Dane is now Vice President of Business Roundtable. I think it's very significant, and obviously the Business Roundtable decided to be much more involved in this whole itch area of workforce needs by bringing someone such as Dane aboard. Uh, thanks, Bob. I appreciate it. Um, and thanks for having me here this afternoon. <coughs> um, man, I, I, I ran a marathon on, and sat on Saturday, my best time ever. And I feel like I've been running a marathon since I got up this morning. <laughs> <laughs> you know what airports are like. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be at the Business Roundtable where our chair, uh, Rex Tillerson, CEO of ExxonMobil, and our vice chair, Eric Spiegel, who's the CEO of Siemens North America, um, have really, I think, laid out quite the ambitious agenda. And for Mr. Spiegel, the real focus since my day of arrival has been on the skills gap. And I, I tell you, you could not find a better champion uh, for Workforce Investment Act issues and Career Technical Ed and Perkins issues than Eric Spiegel. Um, he is deeply immersed in these issues. Every week, uh, we meet every Friday afternoon to talk about the latest reports. We talk not just about the fact that there is a skills gap. We know there's a skills gap. We've seen Tony Carnavali and everyone else's work. We're really trying to focus on what are the solutions that we can uh, try to address through the business roundtable, some of which are, uh, we think, through federal legislation. And to Bob's earlier point, um, you know, this isn't a Perkins issue or just a WIA issue. This is about, and I've heard all of us talk about this at one point in time, it's about alignment. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that we're going to be able to have a grand bargain and reauthorize all these pieces of legislation at one time. But if we could really think about as we move through the reauthorizations how to align these, and that's, real, that's really what we're trying to focus on. We met last week with Senator Murray. We're meeting with Senator Isaacson. The two of them are supposed to be working together on WIA. We continued, despite the vote last week and some of the flaws and some of the good parts of the Skills Act on the House side, that there needs to be an opportunity. Uh, there is an opportunity for us to reauthorize WIA despite those differences. Because at the end of the day, uh, whether this is about children in elementary and high schools or whether it's about adults who are working, who aren't working, who are looking for advancement, um, this is about, at the end of the day for my members, getting America back to work mm -hmm. and getting them in a, in a job that makes more than $9 an hour so that they have a set of marketable skills is what we're looking for. So for us, um, the couple of just bullet points, a couple of important things for us to remember as we move through these, these uh, debates, uh, one is which, of which is, and I never, it's never too far from my heart, the Common Core State Standards. You know, inherent in the Common Core State Standards is this notion of multiple pathways for students, that it's not lock, step, and barrel. Everyone moves through the same pathway. And whether we want to admit it or not, we still have career tech centers where students 
uh, are relegated. They're tracked to programs that are of lower skill. And we have to think about ways in which we not just change the perception of career tech being a much more rigorous or equally rigorous as the traditional path, but it's a viable pathway to getting a good career, whether you choose college or not. The second is that we have to think about workforce skills that are taught for in-demand occupations that are portable and that are stackable. We know that there are a number of industries that have um, industry standards, but there are a number of industries that don't have standards. And one of the areas of work that you're going to see us getting into, which is a little unusual for the BRT, is trying to identify what is a high growth sector that doesn't currently have a set of industry standards and how might we bring our members together in that sector and develop a set of industry standards and potentially over the years grow that work to other sectors but we want to start with one uh, one to, uh, at the beginning especially since I'm the only guy on educational <laughs> workforce <laughs> at the BRT uh, and none of this work can be done without partnerships and it, uh, you won't be surprised to hear me talk about some of the partnerships or to mention a partnership that one of our members uh, is involved in. But we have this, uh, Mr. Spiegel, Siemens has a plant that opened a couple of years ago down in Charlotte, North Carolina. 700 jobs, they could not find the talent. Now there were skilled workers in other parts of the country who just couldn't, uh, for one reason or another, take advantage of the opportunity. They couldn't sell their home. and. Billings, Montana, and moved east, move east. There are a lot of reasons why skilled workers couldn't take advantage of those jobs. But Siemens couldn't wait. They had 700 jobs to fill. So they created a partnership with Central Piedmont Community College. They brought all the curriculum developers over from Germany, worked with the community college, developed a curriculum, and they're creating a pipeline of workers. Many students who go through that program currently have never been to college, never. And many of those students, the secondary students, came through a CTE program. Those are the types of partnerships where the private sector has to put up the money too. This isn't just about the private sector saying, we need skilled workers, figure it out, public sector. It's about everyone having skin in the game at the end of the day. Um, the last thing I'll say is we have talked a lot. Uh, I have combed through years and years of, of official and unofficial policy at the BRT. And for as much as we have talked about workforce, we have never lobbied on Perkins. We have never lobbied for reauthorization of WEA. Those are our two priorities. Yeah. We want to see reauthorization of e ESEA, not particularly encouraged. Uh, we'll, we'll continue to advocate for that. But these two issues, Perkins and WEA, are, are our number two priorities legislatively in my area. Thank you, Dane. Dane, let me just check. Uh, I think you and, and Brenda are on the same flight. Yeah. Are you good until 3.30? Oh, I think we can yeah, make we can. it yeah. until 4. Well, no, oh. you, you don't want to do that. Uh, but but no, my, my point is, Jane, uh, Jane, sorry, we'd like to, if, if you would go ahead, because I definitely want to make sure that folks have a chance to ask questions of the two federal sure. uh, offices. Sure, okay. Uh, well, first of all, so nice to see Dane in his new role. He was a huge uh, help. <coughs> when he was at NGA, a great partner, and we look forward to getting BRT more involved. You've already done that. But clearly, at, at ETA, our big priority is trying to get a good Workforce Investment Act uh, reauthorization done. I was privileged to be on the team that brought you the first uh, Workforce Investment Act in 1998 when I worked with Senator Kennedy. But the bottom line is, that was a full employment economy and the flexibilities that are needed and the interconnectivity with other legislation really drive the reason that we need reauthorization now. Now, a good bill over no bill, anytime. But uh, we definitely are at least happy that discussions have started. We're very sorry to have lost uh, Senator Murray from the subcommittee, her leadership role in the subcommittee. But we're really excited that the Senate has a budget for the first time in five years. <laughs> Just goes to show what happens when you put women in charge. <laughs> no offense to Senator Conrad. But 
The, you know, I, I do think that uh, Senator Casey, for those of you, I know there's a few people here from New Jersey and Pennsylvania, Senator Casey really needs to get educated on these issues. You know, he's a sophomore senator, really needs to know about this, and I think having had my first hearing with him last week, he's very interested in knowing what works. He comes from the section of Wilkes-Barre, Scranton, Pennsylvania, which is not a big city, little city, knows how important it is, so I hope you all uh, take your turn educating his staff. Um, but, you know, when we talk about the economy uh, from ETA's perspective, of course we care about young people. We care a little bit more about out-of-school young people than in-school young people because somebody's got to care deeply about them. That's us. Uh, but we also care about dislocated workers. And in a world that's changing, look around the room, a lot of us either are graying or coloring or both. <laughs> Um, or balding. Or, 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 or that too. But, you know. You and I wish we could color. That's right. It could come. You know, look at, look at the vice president, right? You could have new hair. Um, but I think the. I, he looks fabulous. Uh, but I think that we know that people aren't retiring at 55 anymore. You know, and it does mean that our programs not only have to worry about young people, but those young people are going through struggles with their families as well. They're watching their mom and dad get laid off from a job or have to change sectors. And when you heard all the conversation this morning, by the way, Bill, which I thought was fabulous, you have to remember that perception and feelings have a big part of driving people into what they want to be. You know, and I think that the more we work with young people to educate them about the fact that IT isn't just a standalone sector, it's embedded in every sector. So it's critically important that you learn how to be comfortable with IT, all aspects of it, not just social media. And that, you know, as you're looking at new fields like advanced manufacturing, that we're not there for your mother and your grandmother. They were, they were waning and laying your mother and your grandmother off. Anybody who's from the South, nobody here is old enough to remember textiles in New England, but everybody remembers what happened with Hanes and Fruit of the Loom as they left and just left factories standing there. Pillow Tex was one of the first ones in North Carolina that happened when I came on board with Senator Kennedy. 5,000 people in Coriopolis, North Carolina, working on Friday, no job on Monday. That's their recollection of manufacturing. So we have to educate them. So excited that we have people here from Southwire who are doing tremendous things to re-engineer people's thinking about manufacturing. But we need to remember when we say advanced manufacturing to kids, they don't just think dirty and Norma Ray kind of stuff. They're thinking, you killed my mother's job or my father's job. So we have to instruct them about why they need to get the credentials that both Brenda and Dane talked about, that will save them. But they also have to remember that what their mother and father did was stop learning. They did the same repetitive job over and over again because that's what they had to do. That's not gonna be manufacturing in the future. When I talk to people, especially kids about this, they can't believe that people had the same cell phone for seven years. They just can't believe that that would happen. They also don't remember a time when there weren't microwaves. They never knew black and white TV. And when you say to them, this is how quickly things are changing. When the first cell phone came out, I got my first cell phone in 1987 because I needed it for work. It was a small suitcase. Mm -hmm. And no one else I knew had a cell phone, so you didn't need a caller plan, you know? I mean, there was, and God forbid you went out of the region because then you got paid per second per call. But think about it now, everybody has a cell phone. So what does that mean for our work? In the Workforce Investment Act, we operate with our local workforce boards and we love them and we operate with our one-stop system. But we had to push out of that. We couldn't be your mother's workforce system anymore. So we started relying on online tools to get the kind of labor market information into the hands of young people that they needed to make a decision. And by the way, veterans. We, we make tools for everyone. 
But we didn't stop there. We also have telephone apps so that a young person who doesn't want to go into daddy's one stop because he's embarrassed or she's embarrassed, thinks it's old folks in there, can now get sent to their cell phone when a job that they're interested in opens in their zip code. Government has to come into the 21st century. We have, look at our websites, the worst in the world. Try to find information on a government agency's website. It's like sending yourself to purgatory. <laughs> so we have to come into the 21st century and we have to fund things differently. For those of you that have been funded in the past by any of our agencies, you were successful under the old system. The old system is dead. The old system was a supply-driven system. You train them, you're fabulous, and let them go out and find a job. In order to get funded in my agency, you're going to have to prove that you can not only do world-class training, beginning with the employer in mind, but you're going to have to have skin in the game to place that kid in a job. Whether you're a community college, and I know some of them are very unhappy about this, or a community-based organization, it is no longer enough to give TLC, you have to get them a J-O-B. You have to stay with them and get them. And you have to have partnerships with business that are more than a letter of recommendation, a support letter for you to get the money. The business is gonna have to demonstrate what they're doing with you in the design phase, in the delivery phase, mm -hmm. and in getting that kid placed. What do I, do I think businesses are gonna come into a, a grant with you or a partnership with you and say, we're gonna hire every graduate you have? Of course not. That's, ir that's irresponsible for me to even think, let you think that. But what they can do is promise that every kid that's in your program is gonna at least get an interview. They can promise you that every successful graduate is gonna get a chance to do job shadowing. They can promise you that every single kid that graduates highly qualified is gonna get a look by, even if it's speed dating look, and a mentor from that company to say, you're not exactly the right fit for us, but here's how you can help. So that's the new normal for us. And I think as we welcome, hopefully, a new secretary, our, it's so sad for us to pass up uh, Secretary Solis. We wish her the best, but we miss her every second. Uh, the president announced today that he's, uh, not, he's nominating Tom Perez. We think that's a great a start, those of you from Massachusetts know why I'm saying that. He worked with me in the Kennedy office. The Kennedy people are everywhere, you know, so that, but I think it's really going to be uh, another transition to show people that this was not only Hilda Solis's vision. It's the president's vision and it's the right way to go. Business is telling us they, we need to have them at the table throughout the whole process. I'll stop there and pass to my friend and welcome her back with her gorgeous son. Alicia, and let me just note as you're g g grabbing the mic, uh, uh, the Association for Career and Technical Education, of course, has been one of the leading advocates for many years. So your perspective on where federal policy is going and what to do would be very helpful. Well, thank you, and, and thank you for letting me be here with you today. Today it's great to be back and, and get reimmersed in the federal policy world. I, I probably have the, the opposite take of the governor. I'm, I'm probably a glass half empty person these days um, with, with not a, a lot of optimism about what Congress might actually accomplish this year. Um, I, I do think if we can get some bills moving, there's potential for positive action, but the getting moving part um, is difficult. I, I did want to start with um, echoing one of the things uh, Assistant Secretary Denmas here said at the beginning about how many people are talking about CTE and pathways in a positive way. And I had actually um, pulled a quote from an op-ed that appeared in a publication called Politico, a Common Hill publication, a couple of weeks ago. And it was written by the two former directors of the White House Domestic Policy Council, John Bridgeland and Melody Barnes, from the Bush administration and the Obama administration. So again, bipartisan like we, we saw earlier. And um, it they use the term enterpri enterprising pathways, but they, they equate it to high quality CTE in another place in the article. And they say that enterprising pathways can help boost high school and college graduation rates, close the skills gap, reduce remediation and training costs for employers, and prepare a generation for the demands of the new economy. And ever since I read that a few days ago, I've been thinking, if everybody agrees that we can do all of these things with high quality CTE and career pathways for students, 
why can't we get more support from federal policymakers to do more high quality CTE and, and more high quality career pathways for students? And um, I don't, I haven't come up with an answer yet, um, but I do wanna share a few things that I think are, are serving as barriers that, that I hope we can begin to overcome through a lot of the discussions that you're having here, through actions that you can take when you go home in talking to your policymakers, not just in Washington, but at the local level and the state level as well, because the, the first thing I'll, I'll mention is the political climate in Washington, and, and somebody mentioned things are moving at a glacial pace. Um, there is not a lot of, of real action happening. There's a lot of discussion, there's a lot of bills being introduced, but, but we haven't crossed the finish line on many pieces of legislation lately. And so that means it's going to be up to states in a lot of cases or local communities uh, to move this agenda forward. And um, the Pathways to Prosperity Project has seen that, that work by going out to states and creating this groundswell that that we hope will start to convince policymakers at the federal level that they need to pay attention. Um, but a lot of the work is going to, to occur in state and local communities because of that um, political climate in Washington that um, I don't have to say it's partisan right now. Everybody um, sees their evening news and, and hears policymakers talk. And you know we had a, a markup of the Workforce Investment Act legislation just in the House um, in the last couple of weeks where all the Democrats on the committee walked out because of the partisan nature of that. Um, um, discussion and and we're seeing more and more um, things like that demonstrations like that of partisanship um, where we really need policymakers to be working together and and you heard um, Representative Thompson and Senator Murray say almost identical things about CTE and that is an area where we've had bipartisan support in the past um, but all the other um, things in Washington that are that are volleying back and forth and, and the other issues um, have tended to distract attention from the things that, that we care about in moving pathways and CTE forward. Um, it, the other issue that, that I have to mention is the focus on the deficit and, and this um, number of the fiscal cliff and sequestration and the continuing resolution and one uh, crisis after another related to federal funding has, has again pulled attention away from what we might be doing to improve programs. You know, all fall when we went into offices on Capitol Hill, we heard, you know, there's no money to do anything. We, we have to cut funding. We can't do that because we can't afford it. You know, conversations and um, it, what Nick Pinchuk from Snap-on said this morning um, really struck me that if if we think this is the priority, then it needs to be the priority. And if, if CTE is the priority, then that's what needs to be funded by Congress. And we all have to think the same way as well. Um, we have to get past all of these conversations about um, where to cut funding and, and convince policymakers that there are some places that they need to be making investments um, in programs that are gonna grow the economy, that are going to, to produce that workforce that can then um, you know, spend money and, and drive our economic growth in the future. Um, but that deficit focus has really hampered a lot of the work on all of the pieces of authorizing legislation that we've mentioned um, over the past year because policymakers have invested so much time in addressing those challenges, um, sometimes not as efficiently as they might, um, should, but um, we're hoping that we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel with some of those as, as the CR wraps up and we can start to look forward to 2014. Um, the other thing I want to mention is a, a resistance to change on Capitol Hill. Um, we hear lots of proposals for change, you know, something like the Pathways to Prosperity Report. Everybody looks at it and, and it's gotten widespread support on the Hill. Lots of staff members are very interested in it. But when you start to, to talk about changing federal legislation to support things like students you know, leaving high school and engaging in alternative forms of work-based learning, people start to get a little nervous. And um, you see policymakers, even in pieces of legislation that they tout as being wholesale reform, like the, the Skills Act in the House for Workforce Investment Act, it's really not that different from what we're doing now in a lot of ways. And we very rarely see Congress take on real change in a dramatic way and abandon what they've been doing in the past. 
Um, and sometimes that's a good thing. It keeps them from going too right or too left in one direction or another. Um, but it does require us to step up and really push for ideas that might be new or different or new ways of thinking about moving policy forward. Um, I think there's also still a tremendous lack of knowledge among policymakers, particularly in newly elected policymakers, about the role of different federal policies and, and what their impact in communities are. Um, the alignment issue that's been mentioned up here so many times is so critical, but if you don't understand what this piece of legislation does and what that piece of legislation does and how they're different currently, you can't even start to have the conversation about how we make them work together better. And we see that a lot with the Perkins Act and the Workforce Investment Act. As we've been talking to members of Congress, um, we hear them say, oh, the new Workforce Investment Act is going to put in more money to improve your programs. I'm like, no, that's not the right bill to do that. You know, the Workforce Investment Act is going to help people get to training programs, but you have to have Perkins or some other program to build the training programs and make sure they're of high quality so that when people come, they get access to the skills they need for the jobs they need. So, so there's a lot of education that needs to be done, and that's where all of you come in, um, in your local communities, um, promoting the work you're doing, explaining how policy changes can impact your programs. Um, and then finally, we, we definitely suffer from um, this kind of, you know, Pollyanna, you know, everybody on Capitol Hill loves CTE, the president loves CTE, you know, we're getting lots of positive attention, but then nothing happens. <laughs> um, and, and we haven't figured out, and, and maybe um, as we go through the panel today, some ideas will come out, how to move that needle from that positive attention, from going into Hill offices and having members of Congress say, you're wonderful, we need more programs, to some type of action that will help create those more programs, that will help to invest the resources like Congressman Thompson mm -hmm. talked about. Um, you know, we need to move policymakers from talk to action, um, and that's really going to be up to us, up to efforts like Pathways to Prosperity and, and Career Academies and all of those things to move forward. And, and there's lots of opportunities to do that. So. so maybe that's where you and I can agree. It's an opportunity-rich environment. So here's a challenge. Uh, moving at a glacial pace, and now the glac glacier's melting. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> Uh, but while, so let's do some speed questions while we still have uh, Brenda and Dane. Uh, uh, anybody have particularly, for, yes, start here. One of the biggest problems that I see from the field of education, and I've been in it for too many decades, uh, is that we can have the best CTE programs. We've changed them, we've made them high rigor, we've made them more um, appropriate for the jobs that are available. But the perception of parents is still, it's for those other dumb kids, it's not for my kid, those aren't good jobs, you're a second class citizen, and I am from the late great state of California, and right now what they're doing is they're making every high school kid in many districts graduate from high school with the requirements to attend the University of California. So it's strictly academic, it's theoretical, it's not practical, <coughs> and I'm not surprised that we have a 30% dropout rate. We need the business roundtable to say loud and clear, it's our Sputnik moment. It's got to be more practical, more hands-on. There are great jobs. You can support yourself and your family. When the business roundtable says that to Congress, something will happen. When education says it to Congress, they say you're making <coughs> excuses. You don't want to be accountable. Help us, please. Did everyone hear those remarks? Okay, good. Uh, so, Dane? Yeah. Well, we're, we're taking full advantage of all the love we're getting lately um, <clears throat> and the attention from the business community to to deliver that message. Um, and, and, and not so much, quite frankly, t for me to deliver the message, but for my CEOs to deliver the message. And that's, you know, not everyone is going to go to college, a four-year college. And just because they're not going to go to college doesn't mean they're not going to end up in a high-skilled, well-paid job. So we're, we're pointing to examples that where we have partnerships in our company. And quite honestly, one of the things we've said a lot, and since I've arrived, or my, my members have said, is that we have good examples everywhere. And the problem is, 
we can't seem to go to scale in this country on those good ideas. So how do we take advantage of not just the federal legislation, but how do we take advantage of the good program Siemens has or the good program that IBM has started? How do we scale those up and not simply ask for more money, but rethink the way we use existing dollars? Because the truth of the matter is, there's not going to be a lot of new money. Now, we hope there's a race to the top equivalent for high school, and that CTE is a vital part of that. But all in all, this is going to be about you know, the pie has not gotten any bigger. How do we how do we think about reallocation and think about it seriously? So, Dane, what uh, the common refrain I'm hearing is, what is it that business is going to be doing <coughs> differently this time yeah. uh, as opposed to the last 20 years? I think I've already heard you say, first of all, you're putting BRT business roundtables actually putting we as a top legislative priority. Yeah, no, that that's actual. Um, it is. It's a uh, WIA and CTE are our two number one federal legislative priorities, um, and we're thinking about this. Uh, ironically, you know, I'm, I'm educating my colleagues at the business roundtable so that we think about whatever work we're doing on healthcare, and we think about the jobs in healthcare. How does this all intersect within our own organization? We talk about integration or alignment at the federal level. We need to talk about integration within, within our own organization and how we advocate for positions that um, should not be contradictory. Great, let me get in the back. Uh, lady. Uh, yes. We have a very successful industry-supported public school. In uh, South Texas, Corpus Christi, Texas, we are setting dropouts. We're providing post-secondary NCCR education to 14 different high schools. Our problem is everything says you have to be 18 years old to enter USDOT registered apprenticeship programs, OSHA, and so on. When we are setting dropouts, we are setting them at the age of 16 and 17. And we have students who are graduating from high school at 17. They have the skills that they cannot go to work because 18 is the barrier. Help us with that. Years ago, we used to have for apprenticeship programs, actually co-op programs. If a student was in a registered co-op program, petrochemical, any kind of industry could have them in a cooperative relationship at the age of 16 or 17. We can't even get them into the field, into the area to see what those jobs are. We need help with that 18 year old across the board barrier. Let me ask Jane or Brenda if you want to address this. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it would be really interesting to talk to you uh, separately and love yeah. you to get in touch with me about it because some of those are industry requirements, ju just like a 16-year-old can't use a slicer in a deli. I got it. I got you know, it. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's a it's a liability well, issue that the well, industry... It does definitely tie back to liability issues. Right. right. Insurances. Well, I'd be happy to help you where, you know, if you just get in touch with me, oats.jane at dol.gov, I can get you to the right people. Because yeah. I think, you know, and, and happy to talk, have Larry Temple in our discussions from the Texas Workforce Commission yeah. in case there's something specific to Texas. But, you know, I, I do believe that the federal government tried to get in line not to encourage kids to drop out you know, aligned with state law. But I really think the biggest problem when you talk about the petrochemical industry is going to be insurance liability. Okay, yeah. L let and me ask. You can help us with a, but that's what we used to have with some sort of a waiver yep. in that, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, so whatever we could do with that. Okay. Anytime I, got, I could get a, an assistant secretary's email, mm -hmm. I'm in. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> no, please contact. So let me also ask each of you please to identify yourselves because we are recording this and want to know uh, whom to get back to. Yes, right here. Judy Andrews, Connecticut State Department of Education. Um, the Connecticut Department of Labor um, works with the Department of Education to provide a waiver for student learners, this is in our legislation, for student learners who are in approved education programs so that those student learners can participate in paid internships in manufacturing, engineering, um, all kinds of ha potentially hazardous occupations. But if they are in these approved programs, they do we just need to share the examples of where it's happening and let folks know about uh, where it's on the ground and they can make the connections yeah, and I'm find a little out nervous how they about do petrochemical that's why I want to talk to you yeah. separately because okay. you know just as recently as last week there were deaths in the new shale project in uh, North Dakota so I want to make sure that we're clear about that that there could be yeah. some particulars there and, yeah. okay yes ma'am um, uh, Alicia Sasser, Senior Economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. 
Um, I wanted to harken back to something that Ron Ferguson said this morning, to take it beyond policy and to make it more of a movement. And in this sense, I'm wearing my hat as a parent. I have a middle schooler who um, is on several IEP, individual education plans in the school system. And um, to address these common core standards and help him meet these standards, um, he's been taken out of a lot of his elective classes and put in a learning center. Great, we do want him to read and write, but of the th four children that I have, this is the one that would most benefit from those electives that are related and would spark an interest in CTE. And so I would say that we really need to take this case to the people and to the parents. And as a parent myself, I've had conversations with him and directed him to the Department of Labor's website, which has this great information on occupations, the wages that you earn in these occupations, and what you need to get there. And so for example, he wants to be an auto mechanic. And so I said, okay, great, let's look it up. You know, saw the wage it earned. I said, look, you still need post-secondary education to be an auto mechanic. Oh. Yeah, so you still need to graduate from high school and get good grades so you can get that certificate. I think a lot of parents and a lot of students don't know this. And CTE is not anything that's talked about in the public school system at the middle school level. And I would think that that would be important. Uh, while we still have Brenda, any reaction? Yeah, I'd love to, to react to that and just say that I hope as a result of this gathering, Bill, that we really talk about a communication strategy, really, whether it's to the parents, to the students themselves. But there are so many myths that we have to dispel, <laughs> that it's not rigorous, that it's not relevant, that it's not, that it is second to a regular academic program. And part of the problem is, is that CTE programs are electives, and we need to make sure that CTE courses are given for credit, and that would solve some of the problem. But I really hope, Bill, that as part of this work that we can put together a movement and have a communication strategy and that we're not talking about dead-end tracks that are not preparing students for, an, or that it's for those students who can't make it. This is a program, a system that needs to be available for all students. And you know, business and industry has a big role to play, but they're, they're not the only ones that own up to this. We have to make the case, whether we're educators, whether we're parents ourselves, that this is an important system for all students. Okay, now I promise to get you all out at 3.30. The, ma the magic moment has struck, That's I think. Right. One more question. One more question? Okay. Who's, who wants to go? Yes, sir. Uh, Adam Hutchison, Texas State Technical College in deep south Texas, further south of my colleague. We're, uh, our funding model is changing to placement. So we'll be paid from state appropriations right. based on placement. My question is, um, my ask, help us within, with the structure at the federal level with financial aid, Perkins, whatever, to build competency-based programs rather than course-based, clock hour-based programs. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> Let me just say that we're very, very interested in, in competency-based education at both the secondary and post-secondary education level. There will be um, a letter coming out of the Office of Post-Secondary Education in the next couple of weeks around competency-based education. Uh, the Secretary is very supportive of moving forward on competency-based education. So we're, but we're the federal government. It doesn't happen overnight, and we're, we're working. <laughs> right. No, you're, you're but, actually a lot. But no. But know that this is a top priority for us. Great. We know it's very important, especially in career and technical education when they can demonstrate proficiency yeah. and competency and they ought to be getting credit for that. Absolutely. But we think it's for everybody, not just for CTE students, yes. and it's yeah. also for, the for assessments a, absolutely. So we're, we're with you. And a number of states are moving in this direction. I'd urge right. you to look at New Hampshire That's and right. as well as others. Okay, Brenda and uh, Dane, thank you very, very much. Brenda is. Uh, I'm sorry. My email address as well. We're Brenda, not done yet. Stay where you are. Brenda dot, and I'll, give, I'll leave my cards here. Brenda dot Dan hyphen Messier at ed dot gov. But here are my cards. Please feel free to email me with specific questions and comments. I apologize that I have to leave. There was a miss up on the time, and we booked an earlier flight. So I'm I'm very sorry to leave you. But Sharon Miller's here, and you can email me, and I will respond directly. Now to you me. also I know, Brenda, that with sequestration, you 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 have to land 5.6 percent short. <laughs> of, That's right. Uh, <laughs> uh, our Thank email you. is only open. Yeah. So, so. Can I also just say that we have another great resource in the room, and currently that she works for uh, Representative Congressman Langevin. You've heard Congressman Thompson talk about his partner, Kurtley. So you can ask her. Uh, <laughs> 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 works for Congressman Langevin. So.
So uh, could I also ask uh, Sharon Miller, if you would be willing to come up uh, from the Department of Education. Sharon is going to be sitting in for Brenda, and Sharon is the Director of the Division of Academic and Technical Education. So, um, yes. So, could, I could you identify yes, yourself? Yes, I'm Sharon Thomas Parrott from DeVry Education Group. And I just want to start by um, echoing some of what Alicia has, has talked about in terms of why can't we get um, support for high quality CTE. And words matter. And I think that one of the things that happens is that we care who gets credit in the world. So when people say, well, I push this bill or I push that bill, you know, somebody wants credit, we need to first deal with nobody, the kid needs to get credit. Um, but the other thing is flipping the script, because I'm sitting here and I'm listening, I'm sorry, I'm sitting here and I'm listening to, you know, education that is CTE versus education that is not CTE. And I don't know any education that is not CTE. Even if, I mean, my goal was to be a history professor you know, which you would have thought was not CTE, but it was the professor part that people need to focus on. And we keep talking about CTE like it is not, it is, it is the alternative. It is the only thing. If I want to be a history teacher, that is vocational. It's vocational, it's manufacturing. We talk about people not wanting to, it's words matter. We need to tell stories about what happens in the world and, it, and how people, what jobs people do and not define them as a vocation versus a profession. Okay, uh, who's next? Well, reaction. I'm sorry, reaction. I'd like to hear that said at a school board meeting. <laughs> you know, because that's where the great divide happens. I mean, even in, I don't have any power there. They have to say, I to ask you to attend there. But I mean, I think the, all the federal legislation and most of the state legislation that I'm familiar with has told CTE teachers to meet the academic teachers, to bring academics into your relevant education. There has never been one line in ESEA that tells an academic teacher to meet a vocational teacher halfway. Not one. Nobody says put, rele put relevance in algebra. They say instead in the building trades classes, show them how the geometry class comes in there. I mean, the, the folks who teach carpentry are not algebra teachers, are not geometry teachers. And they have to come together. And there is very little willingness on the local level. Half of them have separate superintendents. You know, so get separate funding. So, I mean, I think we are far away from that, but federal legislation could change that, and that's the kind of thing people should be asking for if that meets the need in your local area to be in a Perkins reauthorization. Yes, sir. With, with, with so many states could you identify yourself? Oh, I'm Ted Annecy. I'm at, uh, out of upstate New York uh, with the Intermediary School District and the Tech Valley Career Pathways Consortium. Um, from a policy standpoint, and I guess the support standpoint, with so many states now moving to the same academic assessments with the park, um, and so much of that material that I see is much more applied as it's going to be assessed, is there, can there be any kind of a push to the begin to, at a federal level to support the development of resources for those academic teachers to start building those bridges? Because right now it's, it's a couple meetings a year with our, between our instructors and our academic teachers in our home school. But with so much application in the, new, in the new assessments that the states are moving to, including New York, is there, any, is there any talk or discussion of actually some toolkits? Educators like to get something that shows them how to do it. And it's, this is very different than the way we've been trained as, as academic teachers. Well, I, I think there's two potential areas there. One is policy to drive it, which Jane mentioned ESEA and the fact that it has never um, asked academic teachers to incorporate relevance and applied learning. That's actually our biggest priority in the reauthorization of ESEA from, from ACTE's perspective and from the CTE community is, is to get more of that language into ESEA so that it's an equal partnership instead of 
the CTE teachers having to go beg the academic teachers to, you know, to integrate academics into their classroom or, or having to do all the work themselves on integration, that it's an equal partnership, an exchange of information and resources and a more seamless curriculum where students are learning and doing and applying in all of their classes. Um, so that's um, a priority within ESEA and, and we've had, you heard um, Representative Thompson mention the Education for Tomorrow's Jobs Act that starts to chip away at a little bit of that. It's one of the first um, pieces of legislation uh, related to CTE that would be inserted into ESEA. So, so there's some policy movement. Um, I also hear you mention toolkits. Um, that certainly might be something that the Department of Education um, or us as a professional association. I know we've been doing a lot of work on the Common Core bringing in um, states where they have some of that rich integration to talk about how it's happening. Um, so there, there definitely could be more that we can provide there. Follow-up work from this conference. Yeah, did you uh, share? Um, I did. Uh, one is to um, put a plug in for the National Research Center for Career and Technical Education, which is developing um, a project called Math and CTE and Science and CTE, and they're actually doing some training to help on um, the you know whatever career area it is to break down the um, either the math science the math concepts or the science concepts, and um, to teach those either in the uh, the math class or in the CTE class and also I'm not sure if there's anybody here from Colorado but there's a very innovative project that's going on there in Loveland Colorado where their geometry professor and their construction professor have gotten together and they've totally ripped apart the curriculum and they now teach both geometry and construction kind of back to back and they're actually using um, you know both math concepts for the students that get the math and the you know CT concepts for uh, for students that um, that do that more with their hands and actually taking on um, both of those students um, both those types of students and um, having them kind of like youth build does on um, put their work um, toward building houses that they're then um, selling to habitat for humanity they have a huge project that gets on um, women girls young girls involved um, in that project as well as um, a lot of the employers and so it's a wonderful example but um, I think a role for federal government is to really get more of those examples out and uh, we've been having a lot of a uh, lot of conversation at the department about how to do that because this is really going to have to be work that's going to have to happen at the local level and be scaled up and we don't want everyone to have to you know reinvent the wheel so more to come on that but definitely look at the National Research Center for Career and Technical Education for a start on that. Thank you Lauren Baker from the Wisconsin Regional Training Partnership in Milwaukee Wisconsin and um, a little earlier, a colleague said words matter. And so there is, there is still a piece of this that even as we talk amongst each other as friends here and in a lot of agreement, that um, I think we need to examine when we are saying and when we're framing even our solutions on um, phrases like everyone isn't going to college, mm -hmm. I, I, it troubles me. Number one, two-year colleges are college. All colleges are not four-year colleges. And, and number two, I think the whole point of our conversation about pathways is the whole idea of presenting broad pathways to young people where they get a chance to look within an industry sector at a variety of alternatives, different parts of which may be good for them at different parts of their lives. And as long as it, it, the more that we can change that conversation and the more I would look at our friends on the federal level to help us change that conversation, I think the better job we'll be able to do in elevating what we consider the middle skill areas, which can both be fabulous careers for people to end up in or fabulous parts of a career ladder as someone heads on a longer educational path. But if we are pitting them against each other, if we say, well, not, you know, not everyone is bound for college, therefore, we've right away made that a second class choice. Well, I, th I, think, I think the real challenge is to make sure that a kid who, when we were going to college, when I was going to college, if you didn't go at 18, you didn't go. But it's a new world. Why shouldn't you go to work first, make some money, and let your employer cost share when you go to get your master's or PhD? So I mean, I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, and I think that part of the reason people have said this, quite frankly, is because so many kids in CTE have an IEP. It's one of the things we hide behind. I don't think, I'm a special ed teacher by training. Many of my kids did not go to post-secondary education after they left me in high school. They did not. 
but they're 45 years old now, and a lot of them have gone back. Many have gone back. They had severe learning disabilities, but now the world is filled with adaptations because of the prevalence of IT. They can go back. Many of them have gone back to get their bachelor's degree in the area. So I think you're right. Our, our thoughts are more progressive, but our language is still the same. Like you're still going in a line from high school into an academic track or a career in technical education track. There's no such thing anymore. And the more we can stop each other from saying that, it's what did Hillary Pennington say today? No wrong door, no wrong time. That What's the difference if you go back to college at 30 instead of 18? Right, right. No, and thank you yeah. for that point because to me, uh, as we work on our advocacy side of it, what the, the benefit of CTE is about the engagement and the, and the various pathways you create as opposed to what the outcome is. And, and, it's, and you start looking at a number of construction tech academies and things like that and you find a 90% high school graduation rate and an 80 to 90% college going rate and, and uh, with, with high rates of uh, completion as well. So thank you for, yeah, I think that's an incredibly important point. Uh, the gentleman right here against the curtain. Well, this, this is actually Could you identify yourself? Much longer than I have. Oh, is it, well, I, I love teamwork approach. Okay. Who's, uh, look, who's going? All right, I'll take it. Um, John Mills from Paul Smith College. I, I think one of the other important things to consider is, you know, we have this stigma of our low graduation rates from two-year colleges and the six-year graduation rate from private colleges. And what we've done in this country is make time as the enemy. And you've done it with federal policy. You've done it with the financial aid formulas, and, and I think we have to realize that we've got to take time out of this equation from, for some of our students, low income, maybe low ability, and they need time to stop out if they've had loans and they stop out for work or for family or for child care, which isn't covered adequately, then they end up with loan repayment problems, all those other things when they still could be on a trajectory to finish. So any, I think, federal policy has to seriously consider this issue We've made time as the enemy, and we've said these are bad results. Sometimes they are, but in some cases, they're not bad. You've just got a special case for these students who want this education. Yeah, I think I fully agree with that, except when you go to somebody on the Hill, you're going to have to have some alternatives, because we all agree there are some really bad actors in post-secondary education, people who have raped and pillaged poor people. I mean, and you have to say that out loud because they exist. They're not all for profit. Let me make that perfectly clear. But, you know, so what if we don't use time as the indicator anymore, 150% of time to degree or certification, how else do we make sure that people aren't being fleeced? Because no matter what we do, there's going to be a time limit. There's an income limit on Pell and now a time limit. And there's a time limit on the years you can use Stafford. So what do we use as proxy if not time? And because it, the, the gainful employment uh, regs are going to get tougher and tougher. And I often say to my friends in post-secondary education, sooner or later, later it will be the norm. And sooner or later it will be the norm for secondary education that gets federal money. Uh, people are going to look, people love flexibility, but they love accountability. So I think as this group continues to think out loud, I agree with you. I think time is a huge bias because who cares how long it took you to get to some place as long as you got the skill. But I do think you're gonna have to have, and I don't have the answer for Congress. If we don't, time is really easy. The Department of Education doesn't have an army of staff to go out and adequately monitor every school, nor does the Department of Labor. We barely get to every grantee that we fund. So I mean, I think you're gonna have to find a way to say this is how we'll be accountable if it's not time. It could be competency. It could be assessment, but then you go around and round about people who aren't good test takers. Okay. Well, I would say that the we should include the federal government, and there are educators that have suggestions. Not all of them may be good, but you can put a team together to get that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me get this right here. Mm -hmm. I'm Martha Eldridge Stark. I'm executive director of NSERV. I work with nine high schools in the northern suburbs of Chicago. Just want to echo some of the things that have been said. Um, we provided a graduate class in geometry and construction with those two teachers from Loveland, Colorado, and they're awesome. But I think one of the important things, I have also heard some distinction between the non-college bound and the college bound. And Loveland, Colorado is a beautiful example because they are an international baccalaureate high school, about 2,000 kids. At this point, 75 to 85 percent of their students take their geometry through geometry and construction. 
Obviously not all those kids are going to construction trades, but it gives their brain a place for it to stick. I know a lot of AP kids that still need a place for the math in their brain to stick. And they need those skills as well as the kids who are going into more skill-based things. But also just one real quick thing on Perkins. If we go strictly and separate and align career and tech ed strictly to where there's a need in the work workforce, we become exactly workforce development. There's no need in my area for construction workers right now. There will be. I would not have been able to fund that professional development if Perkins was only targeted to where there was a need in the workforce. So if you can keep that into sort of more broad all careers, that would be great. So I'm going to take the last question, and I'm going to specifically, but Alicia, I want you to jump in too. So let's say, assume for a second that Congress isn't going to act as it hasn't, uh, <laughs> isn't, going to, isn't going to act in the immediate future, that is the next two years. So that means then that a lot then goes by default to the administrative side. Uh, the nice thing about federal government is, or in any government, nothing, uh, there is no vacuum. And, and just as the U.S. Department of Education has moved in and fairly have to get an ESEA with uh, competitive grants and waivers. So what is it we're likely to see from the administrative side, assuming Congress doesn't act in the next couple of years? And I know that both of you, representing the Department of Education and Jane, Department of Labor, I know that both of you are pushing hard for legislation. Let's assume nothing happens. What, what happens administratively? Mm -hmm. What's um, I think I can talk through um, this microphone. Um, you know, uh, I know that there's a budget coming out, and I feel I think that people are feeling very optimistic given the president's um, remarks about high school reform and the need for a skilled workforce. So I put in a plug for the budget whenever that's coming out. Maybe Jane knows a little bit better. We'll see if Jane has uh, any her crystal ball out. But you know, one of the things that's really fortunate is that when when Congress last reauthorized Perkins, it has this provision in Perkins for programs of study, and programs of study really give us a lot of that flexibility that's needed to define programs that meet a lot of the same specifications for career pathways. So most of the work that we've been talking about for the past couple days and the involvement of business and industry and getting secondary and post-secondary together and the integration of academics and technical um, is a part of our legislation. It's a part of what we do. So there's absolutely no reason why, at least from the CTE perspective, that we can't and we already have begun doing this work work already. Um, one of the things that we've done to make sure that we're moving this work forward is um, we just used some of our national activities dollars to do what the Pathways to Prosperity um, group is doing. And we also started a new national activities project with Jobs for the Future. And we're starting to provide technical assistance. And we just um, actually started working with um, five states. Brenda, I don't think mentioned this in her opening comments, but Colorado, Oregon, Kansas, Minnesota, and Massachusetts and doing this very work. How do we connect CTE into the broader career pathway systems that are developing in states? We don't want Perkins to be isolated, just like we don't want WIA programs to be isolated. We want to make sure that there's a real system in all of these states. So hopefully between some of these various efforts, we'll join forces and work together that we can get every state somehow involved in getting this work done at the system level, but also trying to align our programs accordingly. So at least from the Perkins side of the house, we feel very optimistic that there's no reason why this work can't move forward, and it already is moving forward. Okay. So, you know, if, if reauthorization doesn't come, uh, I haven't been shy about giving waivers out. I think 704 is the number of waivers we have out to 54 states to do things that legally I can uh, give flexibility on, whether it's transferring money, whether it's looking at different ways to deliver service. I'm still committed to trying before I uh, walk away from this to do real integrated state planning. I think your representatives at the state waste a lot of money doing a Perkins plan, a WIA plan, a TANF plan. I really believe we can integrate those so that people are thinking together. I mean, we've done it with all of our labor programs now, so there's no such thing as a migrant and seasonal farm workers plan. There's no such thing as a CSEP plan. They're all in one plan. We couldn't quite get over the hurdle to get our friends at education. We, have diff we still are working out terminology and dates and things like that, all the <laughs> things that people refer to as red tape. So look for the flexibilities. When, some, when people say no to you at the local level, it's usually because it's never been done before. <laughs> 
everybody plays blame the federal government. So many times when I've gone in, because I've worked at every level of government and gone in and, uh, and seen what people couldn't do, I say that's something that the state imposes or the county imposes or the city imposes. Let's peel it back. So don't take no for an answer. And finally, I would say, you know, finally at the federal government level, we have really actively worked with each other. I mean, I think in past administrations, D and R, people have written joint letters. And that's hard enough, getting that through different clearances. But, you know, we're now doing core competency models with transportation, because in the transportation fields, there is an incredibly graying workforce. We are actively partnering with trade associations. The best one I can tell you about is CEWD, which is the utility, the trade association. They're fabulous to work with. And nobody had to put money on the table. It was just aligning what we were doing. We're trying to do the same thing now with NAM and NIMS and MSSC in the manufacturing sector. I would really encourage you, you know, we're doing it on the federal level. You can do that on the local level. You can figure out who the employers are in your area and what are the trade associations that they're linked with. Because these trade associations do some wonderful training and if you don't get in touch with them, they won't know how that lines up with you. So I think those are the things. New legislation would be great, but the time is running out. And Alicia, final and, word. And I'll just say that in the case of Perkins, you know, we're in an actually a really good place because Perkins isn't overdue for reauthorization. ESEA and the Workforce Investment Act have some major structural problems because they should have been reauthorized a decade ago in, in the case of WIA. But with Perkins, we're in a good place. As Sharon said, we can do the things we need to do in CTE. And um, a couple of years of delay will actually give us more time to institute some of the, the work of career pathways and to really dig down to identify what it is that's essential to running high quality CTE programs. That's one of ACTE's priorities for reauthorization is to really put a laser-like focus in the law on what it takes to get those student outcomes. Um, it, you know, it might be nice if Congress wrote a piece of legislation and said you just have to get the outcomes. They never do that. They, they put in a set of requirements, but we want to make sure those requirements are really the things that lead to the outcomes. And I know there's several sessions here over the next two days about what are those elements of high quality programs at the secondary and the post-secondary level that lead to student outcomes? And so a couple of years gives us time to really dig in and, and identify those programs and highlight them so that Congress gets it right when we get to reauthorization. So Alicia, you, I, my faith is restored. You yeah. are in my camp an optimist. Anybody who can say two years of delay, it's going to be a good thing. Uh, they, they're from, we're from Washington. Uh, so anyway, let's give this panel a, a round of applause for us.